Today is Tuesday, September 3rd. Damien, what's on your mind? I got a fresh one on my mind today. I'm, I'm thinking about how uh, there's a limited understanding of the fact that immigration systems, immigration enforcement systems, detention systems uh, are not just country specific, meaning or they're not isolated to a, you know, within a single border. Uh, they're actually multinational. And I'm thinking about a family that contacted me in this office a few days ago. And here's the story and some insights that I have from that story. So to understand the story, you have to understand a little bit about uh, how this new beefed up cooperation network between United States Custom Border Patrol and Mexican immigration authorities is currently working. Uh, this spring, there was uh, an asylum ban, so-called ban, uh, that was put into place by the Biden administration. And that ban on our side of the border here in the United States has resulted in many fewer people coming in seeking asylum because when there's a certain number of border crossers detected in a given week period, the number of asylum seekers that can be allowed to enter to go to U.S. immigration courts to claim asylum or to do CFI interviews, credible fear interviews, drops to a certain uh, relatively small number per day. What's less well understood is that as part of that effort, uh, the Biden administration has engaged countries south of its border to aid in the slowing down of migrants trying to come to the United States to ask for asylum. So you have things that are happening further down south from Mexico, places like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, where the Biden administration is doing things that uh, from promoting legal jobs, legal work in the U.S. through something like the H-2B program to actually talking with those countries about limiting visa-free travel into those countries from other countries globally, right? So, uh, and that's happening also in South America. So for example, Ecuador uh, limited visa-free travel from China because uh, Chinese migrants uh, now famously um, were shown on American news channels to be coming using their, uh, using apps have been shown to be coming into the U.S. through the Mexico border. And these tend to be like middle-class migrants. And we've talked to, about them in a previous episode. So the Biden administration, in other words, is using a lot of diplomatic tools in addition to this, uh, you know, uh, enforcement change, pri change of enforcement priority on the border to try and stem the flow of, of migrants seeking asylum. So what's happening in Mexico, which is bef which is the uh, first country on China's southern border? Maybe you didn't know that. Yeah, you know? maybe you did. Mm, I knew I should have taken that left point of Albuquerque. What Mexico uh, is doing in cooperation with U.S. authorities as uh, part of this new effort by the Biden administration to change the way that people come into the country is they are using their immigration authorities to uh, send migrants from other countries who are in Mexico, seem to be on their way to the United States, back across the southern Mexican border into uh, Guatemala. And then sometimes they'll also send people back to countries like Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, which have shown to be large sources of migrants. This particular story that happened to me where I got this call from uh, these uh, you know, clients a few days ago uh, involves that mechanism. And I got to learn a little bit more about it. And I think it's interesting. So I'll share it with you. I get a call. I'm, I'm working on something. I'm working on some I-129s for the H-2B program. Watch the H-2B report if you haven't. I'm trying to get those USCIS apps saying, you're racing against me. I'm the guy that you got to beat uh, because it's an H-2B cap program. But anyway, I'm working on those apps and I, and I get a call and say, hey, uh, my brother's disappeared. I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry. This is an immigration office. I think you need a kidnapping service. You need Scooby-Doo. You need, you need somebody that can uncover the bandit. That's what I'm thinking. I don't say that. And uh, then I ask about the story, and, and, and this is what happened. So this family, they're from Ecuador. Uh, they have a large contingent of their Ecuadorian family living here in the Northeast. And one of their siblings had contracted a high-end smuggling service, essentially. High-end coyotes is what they call them, uh, to for between somewhere $15,000 and $20,000 to take him from Ecuador to El Salvador to Mexico City 
to Tijuana, and eventually, hopefully, into the United States through California. That's what I came to understand. Now, the service, it's not like he's walking the entire way. I think a lot of people imagine that. He's flying in El Salvador, flying or taking a, you know, luxury bus to Mexico City, flying to Tijuana, and only there is he really going on foot. In fact, these uh, services compete. That was the interesting part, where uh, they compete so that there's minimal walking distance, right? Because nobody wants their, uh, their uh, family to have to like walk for miles in the desert among rattling snakes and uh, places where there's no water. Just like anything, you have choices and, and you pick somebody that promises to minimize the suffering. And that's what they thought they did. Well, things began to go south real quick after the brother arrived in Tijuana. He was taken by a, you know, end stage coyote through what was supposed to be a three hour walk. And uh, instead that three hour walk turns into something called a burn where the, where the, uh, where the route they were supposed to go in was blocked either by Customs and Border Patrol, maybe by a rival gang. The family doesn't really know. All they know is that the brother ends up calling them and he's lost in the mountains. He's by himself. He's lost the group. He said the coyotes have gone away and it's the blistering heat of August in California. He's running out of water. And if you have no water in a place that has no water, then you can't drink water which you need to live, which is good. That's for the 25% of you that can't find Mexico in a map. At any rate, he has no water. And then what happens is also blurry. All they know is that he ends up getting detained, whether Customs and Border Patrol found him and saved him, or he found Customs and Border Patrol and asked to be saved. We don't know, but in this case, it's a really good thing, right? Customs and Border Patrol gets him, he gets to a detention center, he gets rehydrated, and then he's probably processed because then the next thing that happens that the family knows is that he gets transferred to San Antonio, Texas, where you have another detention center. Now here, I'm going to tell you what I think happened. I think at this point, he goes through an expedited removal hearing, what I popularly known as deportation, even though that word doesn't really, doesn't exist anymore in the, in the code. So he's removed. And then things become interesting. The last the family hears from him is when uh, this brother calls from an unknown number in Monterey, Mexico, and he tells him he's okay, and it turns out he's in the uh, custody of Mexican immigration authorities. The family confirms this by calling back the number and seeing that uh, the other person on the phone is a staff at some sort of you know local detention center or pass-through center, and they are told that he is going to a state Tabasco in northern Mexico. And at this point, they're freaking out. They don't know what's happening. They don't know if immigration Mexico means immigration in Mexico or if it means a gang in Mexico. They don't know, right? Nobody would know. You wouldn't know. They call me. Now, years ago, before I was a uh, fancy schmancy H2B practitioner, solo, that's a joke. If you don't know lawyer terms, I'm the opposite of fancy. I'm a solo practitioner in a very niche practice. But before I was even this fancy schmancy lawyer, uh, I was doing removal defense. And you, you can look at my earlier work I was working in detention centers. I, would, I even shut down a detention center in Charleston. And uh, I was working on the border in places like Tijuana. So I knew, and I know, and I'm familiar with how people in the United States get moved from detention center to detention center. And everything I was hearing from uh, these clients, it seemed to me that their brother was on the move through detention centers in Mexico. So this is where I had to start to research things. And lo and behold, there's, there's this really a simple but effective plan that Mexican authorities have started to implement more and more since the asylum ban in the U.S. went into effect, where the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol will transfer those that they deport who are not Mexican nationals and who are Mexican nationals to immigration authorities in Mexico. The immigration authorities will check everybody's data. The Mexican nationals will be released into Mexico, but the remainder are then put into detention centers Firstly, in the north, where they're processed. And then if they are from Latin America, South America, they're moved to Chiapas State, where there's a second detention center on the border of Guatemala. And here, from here, they can be directly released into Guatemala, no matter whether they're from Ecuador, Colombia, or Venezuela, or they can be flown to certain countries. Probably, and this is where I'm not sure, but probably I would guess if the other governments 
give them the go ahead, which is what has to happen when we do ICE flights out of the US. And so I was able to surmise that probably this is where the brother went, which is, is some relief. And at that point, I contacted a local uh, Mexican attorney um, that I found on AILA, American Immigration Lawyers Association. And he was able to file essentially release requests in both of these centers that would simultaneously confirm if our, you know, if this brother was there, and if he was there, give him a chance to be released into Mexico. This is not work that I would have thought of been, you know, even eight years ago that I would have to be doing, because even frankly for me, as an immigration lawyer in the US who was working with the detained population, I never thought about Mexico much. It was this um, kind of zone that people came through from other countries, and all I was concerned about was entry at the border. Now, if you were a policy scholar, if you were a journalist, you were concerned about everything that happened before they got to the US border because of something called pull factors and push factors, which pull people out of countries or push them out of countries on their migratory routes. And it's something that we look to explore more in our podcast, 10 Billion People. But I wasn't concerned about it because apart from wanting to understand what countries were gone through for the purposes of asylum, and apart from wanting to understand if somebody had faced hardships or had been intimidated or harassed or tortured or kidnapped along the route, what happened in the country was much more relevant to whatever I was doing, getting somebody out on bond or trying to figure out an argument for the release or trying to figure out how to get a work permit or, or, or whatever. But in this case, with these clients, I found myself working with detention centers in Mexico and uh, ironically, what happened in the US was in the back of my mind when I was working on this filing with the Mexican attorney because Mexico didn't care so much what happened about what happened in the US. They also just kind of cared about how this person, if they were released, would take care of themselves. Would they have accommodations in a hotel paid for by family? Would uh, they end up getting on a plane to go back to their home country? You know, what would happen? That's, that's what we kind of had to think about. So I found myself reflecting on the fact that even though I was dealing with a multinational immigration situation, at the local level, it was still an immigration situation that was specific to the country itself. The bigger takeaway here is that as the world becomes globalized, as somebody from the other side of the world, like China, is able to take an app and through publicly available information, plan a route that takes them to Ecuador, then to the Dorian Gap in Colombia and to Panama, up through Latin America, into Mexico, Tijuana, you know, to uh, breaks in the border in the United States. We're living in this very futuristic world where kind of anybody is able to do that. The question is no longer what is our immigration policy. It's so silly to think that way. You have to be aware if you want to have any sort of grasp on the problem and, and uh, try and find a solution. What is the immigration policy of the entire world that the person who's traveling has to go through. And in this case, arguably, the family of this uh, brother who got caught up in both the US immigration system and the American immigration system wasn't thinking that way because, well, frankly, why would they? And how could they? And I remember telling them, hey, this is what we've done. And they said, well, we don't want him to go back to Ecuador. And I said, look, I don't have anything to do with whether you want him to go back to Ecuador or not. That's not up to me. I can't age you with that. You know, I'm, I, um, that's not what I do. But what I'm telling you is that on if he's released by Mexico, there's like multiple things that can happen. He could be sent to Guatemala, he could be sent to Ecuador, he could be sent to Colombia, he could be released. You need to be ready to get into contact with him. And you need to know that whatever you thought was the game in 2023 or 2022, where maybe you come to the US through a Mexico that's more or less ambivalent about what happens to its through migrants, that has changed uh, dramatically. And so the way that you think about migration perhaps has to change. That's what's on my mind. I, I feel like in some very real way, immigration into the US has changed and become more complicated just in the past you know, four years through a combination of technology and policy change and um, that's going to have an impact, I hope, on how we talk about immigration in this country. But surely, when we can't even get our basics around uh, 
can't get our head around the basics of what it means to be an immigrant, surely that will take a lot longer than I hope for. Anyway, that's on my mind.